Well, we do. We believe, and I hope that you're here as a believer this morning, and I hope that you've come just to fortify that belief, because over the next 10 weeks, we're going to be talking about different core topics to our belief system. And I hope that every one of the topics will speak to you. It won't be new information, maybe. It may be a big review, but we all need to review what we believe and how we believe it and what difference it makes in our lives. Now, today is National Back to Church Sunday. And uh, around the world at this time of the year, uh, after summer and people are done with vacations and everyone's back in school and back into the routine, uh, we have a National Back to Church Sunday. It's worldwide. And I hope that you invited someone to be with you uh, here today. And if you are a guest here today, a uh, special word of welcome to you. And I want to encourage you to stop at our guest services desk out in the foyer because we've got a special gift just for you. But if you're visiting with us, please know that uh, we are thankful that you're here. Hope that you'll uh, fill out your uh, communication or your connection card that's located there in the pew and let us know who you are so that we can uh, reach out to you. But uh, this is also the beginning of our new series called Believe. And uh, again, I hope that uh, uh, we can have our faith challenged because I don't know if you're like me, but I'm always open to having my faith fortified and challenged and strengthened. And uh, I hope that you've come uh, prepared for that. And I'd like to invite you back next week and the week after that for 10 weeks in a row uh, we'll be in this series called Believe. In the book of Psalms, it says in Psalms 19 and verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. And then if you uh, turn over to Romans uh, chapter 1 and verse 20, and we read this last week, but I want to read it again. How is it that we believe? Well, Paul says in Romans, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And I just love that verse because sometimes we wonder why people don't believe. Now, I'm going to just assume that everyone here this morning is a believer. And maybe you're not, but I hope that you are. And if you're not, I hope before you leave that you will be. But this verse in Romans 1.20 certainly sets the foundation for why we ought to believe. All we have to do is look around us. If we look around us, we ought to be able to tell that this creation had a creator. Now, I know that some scientists, not all, some scientists are believers. But some scientists try to convince us that there was a big bang and all of this is just kind of by accident. But I don't believe that and I wouldn't encourage anyone to believe that because what makes more sense? That this is an accident or that there's a creator? Now just think about it for a minute. This creation has to have had a creator. And God Jehovah is the creator of it all. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we need to understand that what Genesis 1-1 says is true. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As a matter of fact, I so strongly believe in Genesis 1-1 that I would encourage you to accept that by faith. Accept that by faith. My purpose today, as we talk about God, my purpose is not to convince you that there is a God. I think even the Bible assumes that we will recognize that there is a God. Now, if you need to have that discussion with me, I'd be glad to set an appointment with you and sit down with you in my study, and we can talk about the reasons why there is a God and why it makes sense to understand that God created the heavens and the earth. But today, let me just, if I may, assume that we all believe that there is a God. The big question today is not, is there a God? The big question is, what or who is your God? Because this world is filled with many gods. The definition of a God is something or someone that you're in love with and that you give the majority of your time and attention to. That is a God. And there are a lot of material gods. We call them idols in this world today. A lot of people don't like to admit it, but they're idolaters. They worship idols. 
They may worship their investments. They may worship their home. They may worship their car. They may worship their affluence. They may even worship their job because some people are so sold out to their job, their profession, their career, that that becomes their idol. I want us today to understand that there is one God and He wants our attention. He wants us to understand that the purpose of life is to bring glory to His name. Now, we can bring Him glory through our jobs, our careers. We can bring Him glory through our money, our material things. We can bring Him glory by using our houses as just a place of hospitality to invite people come so that we can get to know more people. There's everything that God has given us we can use for Him and for His glory. And to me, that ought to be the purpose of life, to bring God glory in all that we say and do. But first, we have to understand who God is and understand who is our God. And today I hope that the God of the Bible is your God. And I hope that as we go through this message and the messages over the next 10 weeks, that our core beliefs will be, will just be strengthened so that we will be about our Father's business. That's what Jesus, when He came to this earth, that's what He said He was all about. I must be about my Father's business. Well, we have a Heavenly Father And I hope that the purpose of your life is to be about our Father's business. Two young boys were best friends at church, and both had the reputation of being very ornery. One church, one of the boys was homesick. He was too sick to come to church, but the other boy, not wanting to let his friend down, was twice as ornery that day. So as he was running through the sanctuary after church, the uh, pastor grabbed him by the nap in the neck and said, where's God? And the little boy was frightened and he didn't know what to say. And so the pastor continued, I want you to go home and think about that question and you come back next week and tell me the answer. The boy went home, he called his sick friend on the telephone. He said, guess what? They've lost God at church and they're trying to blame that on us too. (laughs) Well, you know what? There's a lot of people in our world, our culture today who have lost God. And I think that if you look at the world in which we live, you'll have to agree. The Bible does tell us that in the end times, things are going to get worse and worse. Now, I like to be very optimistic about people, about everything. I really do. But you know, it's hard to be an optimist about the direction our culture is headed these days. Because God is attacked more and more. God is left out of things more and more. I had someone tell me just in the foyer before this service, I sneezed and they said, bless you. And then she came up to me and told me that she knows of a situation where a person got in trouble at work for saying that. Just can't say bless you. And so on and on and on it goes. In our culture today, spiritual things are really attacked. And more and more people are becoming more uncomfortable about spiritual things. And I hope today that that's not true of you. You know, a lot of times people are uncomfortable about things they don't understand. There are certain things I certainly don't understand, and I'm not very comfortable talking about it because I don't know very much about it. But that doesn't mean that I'm not open to learning more about what I don't know and what I don't understand. And I just hope that that's true of you, especially when it comes to spiritual things. We all have a lot to learn when it comes to the Bible. We all have a lot to learn when it comes to faith and how we can grow our faith and how we can be more effective in bringing glory to God in our lives. And so the more we discuss it, the more that we talk about it, well, then the better at it we're going to be. And we ought to want to become as efficient and as proficient as believers as we possibly can be because, you know, our job, our marching orders as believers is to allow our faith to permeate this world. And so we need to be out talking the good news, the good news of God and Jesus Christ's salvation the power of the Holy Spirit, the work of God in this world. Because even though the world may be going the wrong direction, doesn't mean that God has left us yet. I think one day He will. One day He's going to call this, uh, His people out of this place. And one day His Spirit's going to be out of here because His people's going to be out of here. And this is going to be a godless place for a short time. But you know what? In the end, in heaven, it's all going to be about God. And the more we make God a part of our lives here, the more comfortable we're going to be with God in heaven. And so let's become 
real disciples, real children of, of the Lord, real believers, become serious Bible students and understand that our faith needs to grow and our faith needs to develop. And that's our task, to bring glory to God by the lives that we live. And so today we begin a 10-part series called Believe. It's important to understand what we believe matters. What we believe matters. Don't be casual about what you believe. As a matter of fact, take it so serious that you're going to analyze very carefully what you believe. Don't just grab a hold of something because someone said it. I was so pleased after one of the services last Sunday, one of our great faithful ladies came up to me and she pointed out in the outline on the back of the bulletin a verse of scripture that was a misprint. It was a typo probably, but it was the wrong verse and she wanted me to know it and she called it to my attention and she says, I'm sorry. I says, don't be sorry. I don't want anyone to grab a hold of what I say and take that for truth. I want them to hear what I have to say and then prove it. And I hope that you're that way too. I hope that when you read something, whether it's in the newspaper or even if it's in a Christian publication, if you read it in a magazine or on the internet or even if you hear it at church, that you'll question that, that you'll pursue it and make sure that it's the truth because we need to analyze what we're going to grab a hold of and what's going to be the foundation of our lives and what we're going to believe. And what you believe about God is critical because it's the foundation for everything that you'll build your life upon. A spiritual foundation. We're building upon the rock of the foundation that God is the creator of the universe. And we've got to get it right from the beginning. Because you see, if we don't get it right from the beginning, if you question the first verse of Genesis, well then you'll read the whole Bible and you'll be questioning God at every turn. Well, that can't be too true, or that can't be right, or that's not accurate. But if you by faith believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, and if you accept the authority of God in your life and that God speaks truth every time, and when he says in the beginning, I, God, created the heavens and the earth, if you believe that, well, then you'll read right through the pages of God's Word, and it'll be an exciting journey because you'll be able to uh, uh, attach yourself to the truths of God, and you'll allow the truth of God to build your life into a spiritual experience that brings glory to him. And so accept God's word as truth and accept it from the very beginning right on through the end as being his word because when God says it in our hearts that should settle it. There is no room, no room not to believe. Now you can question, you can have doubts, that's fine. But let me make this suggestion to you as well. In a minute, we're going to talk about theology. The word theology comes from two words, theos and logos. And theos, theos, means God, and logos means word. And so you put them together and you have theos or theology, and it means the word of God. And so the study of the word of God is theology. And when we study the word of God, what do we get from our study? And when we get the word of truth from God's word and build our lives upon that, well, then our life is headed in the right direction. But if we don't build upon that firm foundation of understanding that the word of God is truth, well, then there's going to be problems. There's going to be problems. There's going to be doubts and there's going to be questions at every turn. And again, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to have questions, but allow the word of God to be its own interpreter. The word theology is the study of God's Word, and we need to understand that when we study God's Word, God is going to speak to us, and He not only speaks us to us through His Word, but He speaks to us through the Word of His Spirit, okay? For example, I've had a lot of people tell me that they have a hard time witnessing. They have a hard time sharing their faith because they think they have to know the Bible from cover to cover. They think they have to know book, chapter, and verse. And may I tell you today, that is not true. I can tell you that I've been a Christian by far most of my life. I accepted Christ when I was 10 years old. 
And my parents, you've heard me tell this story before, we were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, just about every time the door of the church was opened, we were there. And I th I'm thankful for that heritage of faith because that gave me a foundation to build upon personally. But you know what? We need to understand that we don't have to be in the know about everything the Bible says. We'll all be Bible students until the day we die because no one's going to know it all. But what I want to say to you is allow your testimony to include your personal experience, your personal walk with God. That is so important. As a matter of fact, I've been to college, I've studied theology, I've been in ministry for over 45 years. And what I want to say to you, it's not my college degree in theology, it's not even all of the years of, ex of experience in ministry that I want to tell people. I want to tell people what Jesus means to me and what he's done in my life, not just 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross of Calvary and rose from the dead to bring me salvation, but I want to tell them what Jesus is doing in my life day in and day out and why I'm a believer. And I hope that you can do the same thing. Let's say you don't know a whole lot about God's word, but you do know that you're a believer and you do believe what Jesus has done for you, and it has brought great excitement in your life. It's that excitement that you need to tell people because when they see that Jesus Christ is making a difference in your life, well then, they're going to want to find out more about it, and what greater testimony can we have? A lot of times people are not interested in you taking your Bible and opening it up and flipping it from page to page to page. They may not understand it any better than you do. But when they see that your faith has made a difference and when you share with them how you've seen God's hand work in your life in this situation, in this tragedy, in that trial, in that triumph, when they see and hear your testimony about how God has been with you at every turn along the journey of life, then they're going to see that God is real in your life because people want something that is real. They want something that is genuine. And the best way to prove to them that it's genuine in your life is for you to have experienced it and share that experience with them. And so, we're talking about God. Who is God? Who is your God? And what are you going to do with God in your life? And so, we have theology. Now, we believe, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so God is one, but yet he's three. Now, you can meditate upon that for a long, long time. And probably the more you meditate upon it, the more confounded you're going to be. Okay? Because it's awfully hard to understand. Now, let me illustrate this in, more, in, in terms of mathematics. One plus one plus one equals what? Three. We all know that. But when it comes to the Trinity... It's one times one times one equals one. And I think that's a good way to try to understand it. You see, Trinity comes from the word tri, which means three, and from the word unity. And so we have three that are unified. We call the Trinity, the triune, and they all have a ministry in our lives. God created the heavens of the earth. Jesus came to be our Savior. And the Holy Spirit lives within us to be our counselor, to be our guide, to be our encourager. And so we have three. We have one. They all have a ministry in our lives, and we understand what that ministry is. But remember, they're not just three. They're one. And God is a jealous God, and we, He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth and understand that He is God Jehovah, and we must keep our eyes upon Him and serve Him faithfully. And so what we believe about these things really matter. What we believe about God really matters. And make sure that we're worshiping the real God and not the false gods of this world. And so we think that it's important to answer the questions, is there a God or who or what is your God and how big is your God and how do you believe in God? 
We believe the answers to those questions are vastly, vastly important. And so for the next few minutes, as we focus upon God this morning, I want to talk to you about six characteristics of God that will help us in the review of our faith about God. Now, let me be the first to say that there are many, many, many more than just six. But this might get you thinking for your conversation with others this week. And I hope that you can think of six or eight or 10 or 12 more than the ones I'm going to mention here this morning. First of all, I want you to know that God is unavoidable. God is unavoidable. Every person here this morning and every person out there this morning around the world sooner or later comes face to face with having to make a decision about God. They just do. I think everyone is created with a sense of a creator within our heart. The Bible tells us that. And so at some point in time, everybody is going to come face to face with what they're going to do about God. And that decision is going to shape their lives for eternity. It's going to shape their lives certainly in this life because what you believe about God is going to shape your life. You're either going to be a spiritual person or you're be a, going to be a carnal person. You're either going to live by this world in the strength of the flesh or you're going to live in the Spirit and live by the power of the Spirit. It's going to be one or the other. And that doesn't mean that we who are spiritual don't have carnal moments, okay? We do have carnal moments. But we pick ourselves up from those moments and go back to the, the way of God, to the way of the Spirit. And we know that our help is in the Lord. Our help is by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. So, who is God for you? Is it the gods of this world or is it the God of heaven? What you believe about God is going to determine your life here and your eternal destiny after this life is over. So God is unavoidable. There's a lot of people that don't want to talk about God. They don't want to have those spiritual conversations. And they will even deny God and run away from God. But just like Jonah, you can't run away from God. You're going to find yourself in circumstances where you're going to find out that God is your only hope. And that happens, I believe, to almost everybody sooner or later. I just hope it doesn't happen in the lives of most people before it's too late. Because you see, after this life is over, when we stand before the Lord, it's going to be too late to call upon God. Because in the here and now, in this life, as long as we have life and breath, we can call upon God, and God will be there for us. But after this life is over, the invitation is over. And all of us one day will stand before God, because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is unavoidable. You have to decide what you're going to do with him. Secondly, God is accessible. I am so thankful that God is always accessible. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter the time of the day. God is not limited by time or space. God is always available. He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He's on duty 24-7. God is access accessible. I mentioned in first service, you know, the idea that some people have about God is God is the God of the universe and he has all these rules and regulations and God's out to get us. Let me tell you this morning, God is not out to get you. God is out to love you. God is going to use all the power, all the power that he used to speak into existence, the heavens and the earth and all the galaxies that are out there. God is going to use that power to pursue you. And he's done everything he can to show you his love, his mercy, and his amazing grace. And if you don't get it, it's not going to be because of God not trying. Because God's going to work through circumstances of your life to try to get your attention. And sometimes those circumstances aren't going to be very pleasant. Sometimes they're going to be very pleasant because you're going to realize how blessed you are. And maybe that is what will turn you to the Lord. But God is going to use every avenue, every opportunity that he can to get your attention about him sooner or later. And for you, it'd be better if it was sooner. And so God is very very accessible. Psalm 145, 18 says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon him. He's accessible. Thirdly, God is resourceful. God is resourceful. Resourceful means having the ability to find clever ways to overcome difficulties. We all will have or have had and will continue to have difficulties in this life. And God has a resource to help you regardless of the difficulty, regardless of the situation, it doesn't matter. Romans 16.25 says, God is able to make you strong just as the good news says. It is the message about Jesus Christ and his plan for you Gentiles, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. Psalm 147, 5 says, God is our Lord, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Psalms 121, verses 1 and 2 say, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The point is this morning, the resources of God are at your disposal. Isn't that great to know? Sometimes I walk into a library and I see the hundreds and even thousands and tens and thousands of books in big libraries. And I think, my, what unending resources. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God who is pursuing you and me. That's the God who wants to be on the throne of our, our lives. That's the God that he wants us to surrender to him. Because every resource that he has, the same resources that he used to speak the universe into existence, that's the power that's available to you. Isn't it any wonder that we ought to celebrate the opportunity that we have to believe in this mighty, mighty God? Number four, God is merciful, and I'm going to add to that, gracious. And some people ask, what's the difference between mercy and grace? Well, mercy, God's mercy is, is when he withholds punishment. And grace is when he gives what we don't deserve. Okay, so God is both merciful withholding the punishment that we deserve because of our sin, because of our behavior. But his grace has provided a way of escape when we don't deserve it. That's what God's grace and God's mercy is. And isn't it wonderful that we can be saved by this amazing grace? And that's who God is. That's who God is. That's the personality and the character of God. He wants to be merciful. He wants to be gracious. All we do is have to call upon him. And he's accessible. And he's resourceful. And he can meet our every need. Romans 3, and 25 say, We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way no matter who we are or what we have done. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. It's a great, great offer that God makes to each and every one of us to come to him through his son who we make our savior so that we can receive his mercy and his amazing grace. Number five, God is truthful. God is truth. Now, I try to be truthful, but you know what? I'm not totally truthful. I've looked back upon days when I didn't tell it just the way it ought to be told. Okay? I don't know that anybody here can say that they're totally truthful. There's been times when we maybe have stretched the truth or haven't remembered the truth. But you know what? God is always truthful. You can always count on God, always. If he said it, it's true. If he said it, you can count on it. If he said it, you can trust it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God is truthful. Trusting is based upon truthfulness. In 1 Corinthians 13, love relationships, Paul there talks about how important it is to tell the truth because those who tell the truth can be trusted. And so it is in our interpersonal relationships. If you're Married to someone this morning and they don't tell you the truth, it damages the trust, doesn't it? But if your relationship is ba based upon truth and total truth, well, then you have total trust in your spouse. Any relationship is based upon truth, and if it is, then there's a lot of trust. 
And so it is with God. God is truthful and he's truthful all the time. You don't have to worry about any mistrust because he's always, always, always truthful. And so you can trust him in every, every, every situation. It doesn't matter how big it is, how small it is. You can trust God and you can call upon him and he will draw near to you. And I'm not suggesting that he's going, always going to get you out of the scrapes of your life. But I am going to suggest to you that if you call upon him, he will be there for you. And he will see you through those difficult circumstances. And he will also accept your praise when you see the good that he has done for you. And then finally, God is capable. And this is the point I really love most of all. My God is able my God is able. He is able to do anything. All things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. And you may be facing something in your life that you think is impossible, but there is nothing possible with God, nothing impossible with God. You see, a lot of people get to a hopeless state and that hopeless state brings them a lot of discouragement, a lot of unrest, a lot of fear. But if you'll turn that situation, that circumstance over to God, God is able. God is able. And he will see you through it. And he may even take it away from you, that difficult circumstance. But my God is able and your God is able and that's the God that we know, that's the God that we serve and I hope this morning that you can say without a shadow of a doubt that that is the God that you know and that is the God that you serve and that you have committed yourself 100% to that God and that you're going to live for him to the best of your ability and you're going to follow the teachings of his word to the best of your ability and you're not going to do it in the strength of the flesh but in the power of the spirit that is the God who is pursuing you and pursuing me let's pray together please God I thank you for the brief opportunity we've had today to take on a big topic to take on the topic of our wonderful God. And God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and for what you're doing. You are all powerful. And God, help us never to paint you into our own little box, our human boxes. And help us never to try to limit you. But help us, our Father, to understand who you really are and how big you are and what you want to do in our lives. And help us to trust you completely and turn everything over to you and allow you to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now, our Father, as we come to this decision time, if there's someone here that needs a Savior, I pray that today they would acknowledge you as God and your Son, Jesus, as their Savior. And that, our Father, they would leave here knowing of your amazing grace. So move in the power of your Spirit in each of our hearts so that our faith can be developed and grow so that we can be strong in our stand for you day by day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.